Corey, and Scott are here. I'm here. And we have all the John Tory did what thing with a staff for political analysis that you've been craving all weekend. But first, first, this unpaid political ad. Hey, you know what's even better than listening to the Curse of Politics podcast every week? Well, it's seeing the four of us live, of course, wearing our own clothes and mostly well-groomed. Yep, your cursed political panel is primed to come to your event with our brand of backroom insights and creative swears and perform on a stage in a way that probably won't disappoint you. Like the sea monkeys would disappoint you because they never actually performed the circus tricks the drawing promised. We will perform the circus tricks you accursed. Want to make it happen? Hit us up at the contact tab at airquotesmedia.com. All right, here's the rundown this week. John Tory, did he have to resign? Was he right to resign? What happens next? Our curse clipping this week is Don Braid's piece in the Calgary Herald about Danielle Smith's pre-election strategy of collaborating with Trudeau on energy and emissions reduction projects. That'll lead us into a discussion of just transition and with the UCP back in the lead, how both Smith and Notley have tricky challenges dealing with Trudeau. Then it's the Pierre Poiliev show, meeting union folks and drawing big crowds in Southwest Ontario. Then Gordon Pinson arrives with a hot cup of tea and our hey yous. Jordan, Scott, Corey, how the heck are you? Doing great. Managed to avoid the Super Bowl yesterday. Um, I, I don't have cable, and I tried to tried to even watch a halftime show last night. Couldn't get it. You know, I it, uh, uh, the the firewall or whatever is uh, is is pretty effective. There, any content would flash up on YouTube and then get pulled down two seconds later. So I saw about you know sixty seconds of Rihanna's halftime show, and that was it. You say it, otherwise known as the Rihanna concert, and then some guys in tights doing some other things. Yeah, did you watch it, Jordan? Only the Rihanna portion. It was excellent. Amazing. Scott, after yeah. what might be the most exciting Super Bowl in history, bar the very ending of it, normally we would be talking about football. But I've got you here, and I've got to know from you, what's in the sky? Well, I have two thoughts. Um, one is that it's surveillance equipment. Um from uh, foreign agitators. That's not the answer I'm looking for. I think <laughs> it's, I think these are probes. I think these are probes that have been sent. And I've been um, sending radio signals into the sky, uh, volunteering myself for sexual experimentation. And so far, nothing's come back. So it, they're probably Chinese. But um, maybe they're looking I, for humpback whales. They could be. It could be a little Star Trek four. Yeah, yeah. 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 Kind of a throwback reference uh, for sure. I do want to say one quick thing about football. <laughs> Fucking old man. My, all my references are throwbacks. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, cool. <laughs> cool. Uh, um, I've got prints up on the wall behind me as a nod to modernity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> watched Forbidden Planet last night. Uh, I do want to say this as a proud father. Before the Super Bowl, which crushed me both financially and uh, emotionally, I uh, I got to sit in the stands at North Toronto Arena and watch my kids score five goals in one game. Five. Count them five. Kid had always wow. played defense. And the coach said, well, we have no players, so you have to play center. He plays center. He scores five freaking goals. Fucking oh, kid's yeah. a stud. So I'm very happy. Jesus. With Caulfield out, that could really help. I think that's exactly what I was leaning toward. He's also small yeah. and quick. All right. Okay, uh, so yeah, let's I'm get to it. Feelings. Since the world is weird enough that there's UFOs in this guy, John Tory has a sex scandal. Man. Man. Unreal. <laughs> so one of the things that I have learned in the post-shame society is that you don't have to resign for things that we previously thought you have to resign for. You can tough these things out. The news cycle is short. The attention span is short. People were already mad that this was distracting them from the green belt and anxious to get back to talking about the green belt. Why did he quit, Scott? Was he right to, and why did he? Uh, he was... Yes, he was right to uh, sliding standards is not a sound argument for why people ought to uh, stay in office um, uh, when when they've made an obvious mistake. I, like, I think a, a couple of things. Um, 
and I want to take a slight divergence. Look, you know, I, I I know John, and I've worked with him. I worked with him in radio. Worked with him in politics. I really like him. Uh, I Wait really a second. Like- is it, if this is about judging his behavior, I'm going to have to leave the call because no, I'm no, no. in no position to do that. Well, that's where I was headed. Yeah. So, so I want to say one thing. Was it like a couple things? So first of all, I know him and I like him. I was still I was astonished. I was as surprised as everybody else by it. Um, but I know him and I like him. It's indisputably wrong, right? I mean, there's just like, it's 2023. You can't screw your staff. Like, it's just that fucking simple. Okay. There's a power imbalance. You know, people can, uh, CEOs get fired for this now, right? Absolutely. So that's just the way it is. So could he have soldiered on for sure? Um, you know, he could have faced the indignity of questions saying, well, when you took this trip and this trade mission, you city paid for two hotel rooms, but you guys were cooped up in one. How come you haven't paid that back? Oh, you will pay that back. Okay. Well, the next question we have is we have a report that you were going over, uh, you were doing zoom calls on confidential issues. Uh, but she was in the background because, oh, as it turns out, by the way, that was at a matrimonial, uh, home and your wife wasn't there and just all that all the unseemly awful shit right some of which is technically not just technically but also legitimately inappropriate from a from an ethics standpoint uh a managerial standpoint and all of it is going to be grisly and gruesome on a personal level and incompatible with tucking your tail between your legs and trying to repair your marriage and so i don't think that john tory i know has the constitution to face those kinds of questions. I know politicians who would. I know politicians who would implicitly and explicitly say, I don't give a fuck. Uh, this job is more important to me than anything else. It's more important than flaming the budget process. It's more important than flaming my family. It's more important than, fl- I, I don't care, man. I'm happy to face those questions. He's not built like that. And he couldn't survive it. What would have happened is he would have ended up in the worst of all possible ones. He would have tried to, then he would have blinked, then he would have crumbled, then he would have cried, then he would have resigned. Um, I want to say one thing more, though. Um, then that, he shouldn't have run again. What? Then he shouldn't have run again. Right. Um, well, that's a whole other calculation, which I think, you know, probably isn't of sufficient interest to, to us to really explore in detail. But I think it's a legitimate issue. Um, I just want to say one other thing, though, before we go further, just kind of a pause that I think proves a point I want to raise that um, proves the value of this podcast and maybe the podcasting format in in general, because this is a point that can't be made on television or radio. Uh, I Jeff wish shared now. Jesus. I wish I wish that the men and it's men mostly, right? Because fuck, I'm one and I'm a pig uh, like everybody uh, or maybe more than everybody. Right. So I make no claim to moral uh, superiority, just the opposite. You're not a pig. You're a lizard. That's right. I'm a reptile. So I want that <laughs> clearly established. There is no moralizing on my standpoint, but I wish and, and we could only make this point here. I wish that the men that are involved in these sorts of things would think not just of the ethics, but think not just of the appropriateness of the conduct. Think not just of their family, but I wish they would think of the fact that they force, by dint of the publication and publicity around these events, they force us to think of them fucking. They force us to think about, oh, my God. So he was sleeping with this 31-year-old girl. Now, she's young and attractive. He's 68. And then they're disrobing. And the next thing you know, your mind can't help but think of them lock it up and you kind of go, okay. And like, I don't want to think of my political leaders in that way. Like I know that Justin Trudeau screws like an outboard motor, like an Olympic champion. I'm positive of it. Most of them can't. I don't want to have it in my mind. And once it's in your mind, you can't say to yourself, stop thinking about it. Cause when you say stop thinking about it, it forces you to think about it. And it's an inevitability. As soon as you say I had an inappropriate relationship, your mind starts skipping inappropriate. Okay. Where did that happen? Oh, oh my God. It's at the mermaid motor in. Oh, Jesus Christ. That place, man, I would hope they took the bed spread off. It's filthy. That thing hasn't been washed since 1977. On and on and on. And just, you know, again, so I'll just leave it at that. But let's be honest. We're all men are so fucked that a 68 year old man can think that he's going to take his clothes off and that that 31 year old girl is excited about fucking him. Like, it's just crazy what men can convince themselves of. Just (laughs) crazy. You hear you hear the belt buckle falling to the ground and you hear the click of the light going off. That should tell you that you're up to no good. Couldn't possibly bear. Couldn't possibly bear for the lights to remain on. Jordan, maybe we should go to you. <laughs> Jesus Christ. If we, if we have any listeners left after that. Uh, They're all thinking it. Come on, goddammit. I don't know. 
I don't know. I was struggling to find a way to do this segment without thinking about John Tory having sex, but here we are. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Listen, did he need to resign? I don't know. I think you're right, Scott. He probably could have muddled through. It would have been real ugly. Um, and, and for all the reasons that you have colorfully enumerated. So I think for him personally, he probably made the right call. Um, look, I don't know John Tory. I only know his public record, uh, which, you know, many have judged to be, to be quite sound. I have disagreements with him on a lot of policy levels, but, I think uh, it has been interesting to observe people falling all over themselves to praise him for resigning as though this is a really great and morally upstanding thing. And I think what gets lost in that is that he did the dumb shit first, right? He did this very stupid thing. He did it for a number of months knowing it was wrong and he resigned after the star broke the story. So I'm not based on those facts alone. I'm not falling over myself to praise him for uh, for stepping down after doing a shitty thing. And I do want to say I'm not surprised by the shitty thing. Um, I think that there is, uh, in 2023, it politics is still a very difficult environment for young women. It's a, And at times a very hostile environment for young women. You're not going to find anybody uh, who has worked in politics through their 20s and early 30s who hasn't run into this sort of thing uh, on a personal level. And it has really, it, it really does have to stop because, you know, there's a lot, there's been a lot of talk about this being a consensual relationship and so on. And we don't, you know, we don't know the particulars of that, but we do know about the power imbalance. We do know that this was somebody who was a great deal younger, who was in a subordinate position uh, and, and who, you know, doesn't, doesn't have a voice in this. And I think that on the, the basis of those facts alone, it's really problematic. And I hope, I hope, though I doubt, that this will serve as a warning to the many, 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 many other men in politics who are engaged in this sort of shit. Uh, that it doesn't go unremarked on and it doesn't go sort of unpunished uh, in this time anymore. I think beyond that, um, I don't have a lot of feelings about it, but surprise is not one of them. Floods, wildfires, atmospheric rivers, Tornadoes, the pandemic, not the cheeriest way to start a story, I grant you, but all too viscerally part of our collective consciousness these past few years. We've been talking here about our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and their commitment to network resilience and reliability. It's a cultural thing with them. Embedded in that culture is a thing called an EMOC. EMOC stands for Emergency Management Operations Committee. It's a group of 60 people over at TELUS, and while committee assignments in some settings or places where action goes to die, the EMOC is just the opposite. When a large threat to safety and connectivity is imminent and critical resources are required, the EMOC springs into action for rapid response and recovery. In a crisis, they meet twice daily to assess the situation and, working with community leaders, build critical plans to restore network service and connectivity and manage safety. Beyond the wires and cell sites, the TELUS team also provides humanitarian relief, evacuation centers equipped with Wi-Fi, food delivery to isolated communities, virtual healthcare services, funds and fundraising drives to help with relief efforts, cleanup of affected areas, and more, as each situation requires. Internally, their own people refer to the EMOC as the Wayne Gretzky of emergency response. And, lest you think that's a gratuitous label, hurly burlyites, like Gretzky for hockey, the EMOC has won just about every award imaginable for their recovery and relief efforts. I'd list them, but we'd be here for a while. Obviously, they don't do it for awards, but TELUS has a right to feel proud of their commitment to resilience and reliability. Whether it's billion dollar investments in operational technology, or people going way beyond to help other people stay connected in the direst conditions. More on this next week. Corey, do you want to pile on or can I ask you a different question? Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I, I'm happy to talk about something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of interested in what I think this, this means for the city, you know, uh, setting aside 
you know, uh, all of the details of it and, and the ethics of it and all, all of that. I'll leave that for other people. I, I'll join, I'll join the line of people saying I'm not uh, someone uh, in a great position to cast judgment on others, but I, you know, I, I think for the city, this is, this isn't good news. Like, I think we're going to have, you know, I think they've got to call uh, the election in 60 days. Then I'm not sure what the, the minimum writ is for, for city elections, but say it's another three months, you're probably six months before you really have a, a functioning mayor's office again. And this is a really critical period for the city. There's a lot of big challenges going on, uh, whether it's uh, violence on the subways and elsewhere in the city, you know, sort of a bit of a mini crime wave going on, uh, whether it's the serious financial trouble that the city's and it's, you know, part related to that around low TTC ridership. Uh, there's a lot of big issues and, uh, you know, it's in the middle of the budget process. Like this is, this is a terrible time to have, uh, uh, the body politic uh, thrown into upheaval. And, uh, and I, I think that's too bad. And, uh, you know, it, that, that's really, I think, for, you know, regular folks who are living in the city of Toronto, where, where you know, the damage is, is, is greater, um, that, you know, takes it beyond you know, a personal problem or tragedy or, you know, difficult period, however you want to describe it, and, and puts it into, into into the public policy you know governance realm is is what the implications of that are and i you know i think they're significant so you know it'll be interesting to see who the new mayor is uh you know it's i think it's going to be a very wide field of people who i would describe as uh you know reasonably low profile you know uh you know some very good names uh out there you know whether it's the deputy mayor or whether it's brad bradford or stan cho i haven't or, heard of any of them or like Layton, but like there are you know if you follow if you follow you know, municipal politics, you might know some of these people, or if you follow provincial or national politics really closely, you might know some of the people who are being talked about. But like, they're all very low name recognition. Tory himself, yeah. I would say, you know, like uh, clearly 100% name recognition. He's spent the last decade as the most popular politician in the GTA um, uh, based on public polling. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a, you know, a, a clash of, of, of minor players, uh, and, and probably with extremely low voter turnout and whatever the special election is like, you know, municipal elections are, are low turnout to begin with special elections, even lower. Uh, I could see someone being elected with tens of thousands of votes and, you know, with a, a plurality of support that's in the twenties. Uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be a very weak mayor, no matter how many strong mayor powers you bestow on them, they're going to have a very, very weak electoral mandate. Uh, and, uh, we're basically going to be without a functioning executive, um, or a properly functioning executive for, for six months or more. Yeah. You know, there's just one micro political element to this, Corey, I'd like to just run by you. And, and, and you know, nobody's going to give a shit because who cares about these people? But there's some other people that got, he didn't just blow up his own life and maybe the life of the woman that he was having the affair with. He also blew up the lives of his political team. So people that had been with him for a decade, had helped get him into office, had put their own reputations alongside his reputation, had reorganized their lives to support him politically. And it takes me to my question about him. I'm not judging that he had an affair, but it t I am judging him running again for the third term when he was having an affair and when he should have known that there's a reasonable prospect over the next four years, I'm going to get caught doing this. And and with these with these consequences, he, I mean, like for the people that have been around him and have supported him, this is also a body blow. Oh, for sure it is. Like, <clears throat> you know, politics is a, is a team endeavor. Uh, always. And, um, and you've got a team of people who are, are, as you say, putting their names and reputations on the line, they're disrupting their lives in, in very substantial ways to do that. So yeah, it's very disappointing that 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 would be, you know, that, that you would kind of enter into that with a, a certain amount of recklessness. Um, so, you know, but I, I think that just comes to judgment. I think, uh, you know, pe people are, are, prone to episodes of poor judgment and never more than when it intersects with their personal lives. And, and so I think, you know, there's, there's clearly recklessness in that, but um, you know, it's very human in terms of how the psychology of that comes to pass. I think nobody gives up the ring of power. Yeah. Nobody gives true. up the ring of power. Yeah. You can say David that, you know, how could you run when you must've known that there's a strong likelihood that this would, 
uh, become public. But like, hey, man, you know, denial ain't just a river in Egypt that, you know, people uh, pan on like politicians dudes have been able to drink from the denial cup for a long, long time. So I don't find that hard to um, hard to understand at all. I want to add one quick thing to what Corey said, because I think that, uh, you know, there's uh, in addition to candidates going to come forward and yeah, we're probably going to see a wide field for all the reasons Corey said, because people who think about it will say with nobody having very high name recognition, this could be a lottery and, you know, like throw my name in there. You never know. Spin the desk. I might win. Um, so you're going to see a crowded field and it will feel like maybe these people aren't well known. Maybe somebody will emerge and really, you know, capture our imagination between now and May as they sort of run this thing out. But there's another implication from my perspective, which is that the cracks we're feeling in the city of Toronto are because the city of Toronto is asking to do more than a city anywhere else in the country is being asked. And I know that Vancouver, Montreal and Ottawa are all going to, but the truth of the matter is overwhelmingly, like, you know, if we have a, you know, we got a hundred thousand people each year added to the population of the city. Um, there's already housing issues. There's social infrastructure issues. The infrastructure of financing the city of Toronto, in comparison to the demands and the services that it's asked to sustain, those things are so desperately out of whack. And I go back to what our old boss Paul Martin was talking about twenty years ago. You know, a new deal for cities. Uh, I think there has to be a new deal for Toronto, and I think both levels of government. Uh, in Queen's Park and federally have to say, we've got to constitute and approve some other kind of financing mechanism. I don't know if it's a municipal sales tax. I don't know if it's a fundamental large transfer. Nobody, I mean, people campaigned against a land transfer tax and won doing that. So no one's going to want to embrace new taxes, but there's got to be some reconstitution of the financial mechanisms that sustain the city of Toronto, unlike any other place in the country. Because it's being asked to do too much, and the evidence is obvious. It's not doing it well enough, and it ain't going to get better. It's going to get worse. And I don't give a shit who wins the election. So, in the past year, our sponsor, CN, has implemented a policy of radical simplicity. Trains leave on time, period. All trains leave all stations on time. Okay, maybe it's not so simple. From coast to coast in Canada and down to the Gulf of Mexico, thousands of CN railroaders have to make sure tracks are clear, gears are meshing, and everything is running on schedule everywhere. To their enormous credit, that's what they've done. And here's what that has meant to one of CN's oldest and most important customers, Canada's grain farmers. This past October, CN moved more grain than in any other month of its 100-year history. November was just shy of an all-time record. December and January saw the same kind of performance. Network velocity, the measure of an average number of miles traveled per day per car, hasn't been as good in years. We are now halfway through the grain season. The Canadian winter has been, well, you know, the Canadian winter. But farmers are getting their grain to markets in Canada and overseas on schedule. After the drought and disastrous weather of the past season, After the drought and disastrous weather of last season, this year has been something between a relief and a pleasure. To be clear, CN railroaders have had a lot of help. Grain farmers, shipping companies, country grain elevators, and the people who run the export terminals of Canada's major ports all worked in sync. And that, of course, is the key. Our supply chains don't need more government regulation. They need cooperation from origin to destination. And, of course trains that leave the station on time. Jordan, I didn't, I did not have my money on Scott taking a sex candle and making it dull as fucking dishwater. (laughs) Oh my God. What was that? Let's talk about fiscal relations. Fuck me. We're moving on. We're moving on. Toronto's had enough of our time. We're moving on. Listen, we got a clipping today from Don Braid in the Calgary Herald. And it's about, uh, the woman with raccoons running around in her head. Uh, they're Danielle Smith. Um, Going dukes up with Ottawa has helped successive Alberta Conservative governments keep themselves in office. With the NDP so strong these days, the UCP will be tempted to turn all eyes toward the hostile federal government, her words. But the old game is dangerous and unpredictable today. A flat-out political battle with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau could hurt the UCP if it's seen to destabilize the economy and even the country. And so the Ottawa strategy has morphed into something more election-ready. 
Smith holds firm on key demands, but invites Ottawa to collaborate on a range of energy and emissions reduction projects, including carbon capture and storage. Ottawa has to stop talking about just transition, which she feels signals an end to oil and gas. The federal bill should instead refer to sustainable jobs. This will likely happen, and many others want the change too. But Smith's other demands will be tougher for Trudeau. If the collaboration fails, she has her excuse to paint Trudeau as the intractable villain and launch the Sovereignty Act. So, team, that, that's that's what Don Braid has to say. So, team, recent polls have shown that Premier Smith is back in the lead over Notley in the NDP and is more likely to win the most seats than Notley in the NDP. Big, big showdown in Calgary going on, and the NDP have to do better in Calgary than they're doing. Jordan. How have the UCP gotten back in the game and what are the NDP supposed to do out there? Yeah. So, I mean, notwithstanding the raccoons, which I mean, I hope we can get that on a mug. The rac- that that's, <laughs> that's a curse of politics <laughs> original right there. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think we have to put the polls a bit in perspective too. So, I mean, obviously what's happening in Alberta, Calgary is, is, is where the, the show really matters. And, and if you look at the NDP vote, They've grown, they've actually grown in Calgary pretty substantially since 2019. So I think they're up about 15 points and their vote is pretty efficient there. So I'm not, you know, to see the UCP surging in rural areas, I mean, that that's like a wasteland for the NDP anyways. Uh, the NDP continues to have a lock on Edmonton and Calgary is like, I think they're like within two points right now. So I think it's important not to, to overstate that, but what what I'm particularly interested in is is what's going to happen with Notley and or pardon me with um with Danielle Smith and the federal government and how she's positioning herself on issues like healthcare uh, as well as energy because I know that the NDP and Notley they are hoping and praying that the ballot question is going to be around healthcare that is the strongest possible place uh, for them to base their campaign and so. What they really need for that to occur is they need Daniel Smith to pick a to pick some sort of a fight with the feds. They need they need that to not be a settled question. So for me, the interesting thing to watch for is whether Daniel Smith can be disciplined enough to close that chapter with the feds quickly, move on to ground that is a lot more favorable for her, which is economic just transition, those sorts of pieces, and kind of continue to wage a bit that culture war on that piece. And if she's able to do that, then, you know, then I think that there is a real issue for the, for the NDP, because at the end of the day, if the ballot question is who is best going to manage cost of living and economic factors, that's not really an advantageous ballot question for Notley. But if it turns on healthcare and privatization and service delivery, she's in a far, far better place. And I think if you watch, if you watch what her messaging has been over the last month or two, like you can see that the party's putting a pretty disciplined focus on that. And the last thing that I would say in terms of what the NDP needs to do, um, you know, if it were me, I think this is the moment for for a well-funded war room, right? Danielle Smith uh, is nothing if not a treasure trove of material, and she's shown herself to be easily distracted. Um, so that's a place where if you put some investment and if you drove that pretty hard right now, I think you could yield some pretty good results in terms of distracting your opponent, getting her off track in this critical period leading up to May. Corey, the whole brouhaha over just transitions, just the fucking term. If you just change it to sustainable workers, you're fine. Yeah, I think it's more than that in terms of what's driving the unpopularity of that idea. You know, as we've talked about before, I think it's it's not just bad comms, it's bad policy. Um, but, you know, it, it, the story, I think, is, is, is twofold. I think you're seeing uh, some good fortune in terms of, of uh, that issue coming onto the fore. I think it's, it's Trudeau throwing her inadvertently a lifeline. But I think the second part of this is you're seeing a lot more discipline uh, from the Smith team, like they were sort of uh, throwing out issues uh, that were, you know, backwards looking around the pandemic and pandemic. Uh, They're finally measures. reading Brooke Piggott's data. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Like, it, you know, m- m- you know, focusing on on the economy, focusing on forward looking issues uh, around uh, the energy sector, etc. Like that's the sweet spot 
for the UCP for sure. And, uh, you know, the person who kept bringing up all this, the, the pandemic stuff had, had been Smith herself. And, and she was really getting in the way of her own, uh, government's reelection, uh, for, uh, you know, f- for several months. Now, part of that is, you know, somewhat excuse in the sense that the leadership race, you know, she she tacked towards those folks. They they really are the people who put her in office. Uh, but you know, the that adage of dance with the one that uh, brung you can uh, is not always a virtue. It can be a vice as well. And I, I think it was was getting in the way of her communicating on issues that matter to the general public. So you know, I think there's there's more discipline that's evident. Uh, you know, I think you can credit some of that to uh, Steve Outhouse going in and sort of putting his arms around the thing uh, from a campaign manager perspective. So I think kudos uh, to him in terms of how he's uh, performing so far, um, but also to her, because at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the first minister, the principal uh, candidate uh, is the one who has to actually exercise discipline. And, and you're starting to see that happening and her numbers are improving as a result. Like uh, I think the NDP is in real trouble. And, and I think it's um, I, I agree with much of uh, Jordan's analysis Healthcare is the place where it makes most sense for the NDP to fight. Uh, you know, Smith could have come to Ottawa and and gotten in a big scrap on on the CHT with Trudeau. She she opted not to. She opted to have a very awkward handshake and move on. And uh, I think that was smart. I think that was strategically smart. Uh, and um, uh, you know, if she keeps making uh, solid decisions like that and maintaining that level of discipline, she's probably going to be reelected or you know elected as premier. So if you're a long-term or even medium-term planner, you tend to want to make sure you have enough of the really vital stuff in life, well, before you run out of it. Regular listeners can guess what that stuff would be for me. Hint, it starts with an R and ends with an M, and there's only one other letter. For Canada, shipping container capacity qualifies as really vital stuff, as many of the goods we all rely on move in and out of the country in containers. Our sponsor is the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. And we've been talking the last little while about how they're proposing to build a brand new marine terminal for shipping containers at the Port of Vancouver, Roberts Bank Terminal 2. Because container capacity on the West Coast is quickly diminishing. Because trade needs are only growing in Canada, and the Port of Vancouver is a critical gateway for Canada's trade. Because it will strengthen the link between our country's businesses, big and small, and the global economy. Because the economic impact will be 17,300 well-paying jobs and $3 billion in additional GDP annually during terminal operations. And because, frankly, we've all had it up to here with supply chain issues, so scaling up right away will help connect Canadians with goods when they need them. But there's another key aspect to the long-term planning of this critical port project for Canada I want to talk about. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority's vision is for the Port of Vancouver to be the world's most sustainable port. And one way they're focusing on meeting that vision is by working with all their partners to build a zero emission port by 2050. You heard me right, the entire port community. Building and supporting low emission tech initiatives in an effort to phase out all port related emissions by 2050 is part of that vision and supports the government's goal to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority has a proven track record of building sustainable infrastructure projects, all while being a trusted partner of government, business, Indigenous groups, and local communities to get the job done. Scott, it seems Notley's in such a tricky position to me because, you know, she, she, can't, she can't agree with Smith. She's trying to defeat her. But she can't agree with Trudeau. Because then she can't get elected premier of Alberta. So the more that there's issues going on, federal fed prov, there's no space for her. Well, strategically, Notley faces a brutal like calculation, which is, do you think you can muscle a campaign into being about healthcare? In which case you dedicate all of your leader's energies, particularly her time at the microphone on healthcare and establishing that as the frame and establishing it. Uh, herself as a champion or do you concede that that's not going to be possible or at least it's not obvious that it's going to be possible that in order to win you're going to have to go through the fire of dealing with the economic uh, conditions of Alberta and the economic future of Alberta in which case then you have to position yourself as the person who can get the best possible deal out of Trudeau whether that means collaboration or conquering them 
And so, you know, then you have to make the argument that, which is counterintuitive because UCP and Smith will have all of the advantages on this ground uh, when it comes to who do you most think you can, it can take the, you know, take the fight to Trudeau. Um, so then Notley has to, you know, make the argument that no, 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 right? Smith is manifestly the worst person to get that, whether it's collaboration or confrontation. That's a really tough argument to make, but it may be the inevitable ballot question and you're forced. If you can't, if you can't draft your own ballot question, then you're going to have to win the ballot question. And so that's a strategic decision they face. And it's super, super, super difficult to make and it requires enormous discipline and a real, a, a, you know, a real hard trade-off calculation. Um, you know, the, and that's why what's happening now, that's why this Don Braid column is so smart, because I think that Smith, you know, her natural predisposition to demonize Trudeau and say the federal government is trying to fuck us six different ways, that position is enormously enriched and strengthened and, and, and made more legitimate if it comes in the context of what is seen to be a legitimate effort to work together collaboratively on behalf of the public interest. And so by by trying to move in this direction, by not fighting over the health care deal, by trying to say, you know what, let's 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 get our labels straight, prime minister, on what we're doing here economically in Alberta. And then let's start to work on stuff. And she can also set traps by obviously making making litmus tests that can't establishing litmus tests that can't be met by the federal government. It's Alberta. Whatever Trudeau does isn't going to be good enough. For sure. Right? It, it won't be good enough for Smith and it can't be good enough for Notley. That's right. And it's, I just want to pick up on maybe what Scott was saying, because, you know, Notley, <clears throat> as recently as three weeks ago, was already lining things up to do exactly what Scott has said. So she has called on the feds to pull back on the just transition legislation. And the argument that she's making is that there needs to be more money for Alberta. So she's sort of positioning herself to set to oppose oppose the concept as presented by Trudeau and the Liberals and Singh and everybody, but argue for a larger slice of the pie, whereas she's, you know, suggesting that Smith would, would walk away from all that money and not get a good deal for Alberta workers. So I think you're absolutely going to see her doing that. And I think, you know, it, it is a very difficult bind, but this isn't like an unfamiliar one for Notley, right? Like this right. is, this is the way of, of, of that conflict uh, and, and has been the entirety of her leadership. And I actually, I am actually persuaded that there is some advantage for her in showing that she is she is so loyal to the interests of Albertans that 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 it crosses her partisanship that she is willing to you know she will break with Singh she will really? push back on Trudeau uh, if that's what's right for the people of Alberta and I think that that actually is really key for her personal brand in the province and that they're going to protect that really really strongly through this period and I think we're already seeing them line up doing that well it, but you know but as we I, just, I don't, I don't Dave, think it works though I, like I, I i just don't see how that works because like i think the path uh for alberta like if you're there representing alberta it's not about you know having a bigger tin cup that you're rattling to the federal government to shut down the energy industry it's to say that we should be growing the energy industry in canada we should be exporting more uh particularly natural gas from our country uh, to other countries to displace dirty coal and, uh, you know, uh, uh, other energy commodities that uh, have a higher carbon footprint. It should be about growing the energy sector and benefiting from it, not, you know, the uh, how we go about dismantling it. I think that's that's the winning political message. And I don't think Notley will ever go there because she doesn't agree with it. Like, ultimately, you know, she accepts the premises of uh, Justin Trudeau and, you uh, uh, and others who think that we should be, you know, net new, uh, net carbon neutrality for Canada, not taking a larger global view of it, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I think there's lots of room to disagree with that. Uh, and particularly lots of votes to disagree with that in, in the province of Alberta. And if, you know, if you're just, you know, talking about how big the settlement check should be as you shut down the energy industry, it's not, it's not a winning message, no matter how, you know, adeptly you think you're selling it. Little little bit of spin there, I think, coming from our friend Corey. Now, maybe spin he believes in, but it sure sounds to me like talking points I'd want to employ if I was uh, opposing Notley. Let, I, I just want to add one thing. Well, um, I mean, listen, listen. It is it 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 has the 
it has the unfortunate uh, byproduct of being spin, but it is also, I think, qualifies as analysis. If yes. you are bidding for seats in the city of Calgary, you can't be seen to be wanting to weaken the oil industry. Maybe in Edmonton you can, but I don't think in Calgary you can. It's too fundamental, too, too existential to that city right now. I think well, also it, though- it's like, sorry, but just, just on this point, like you had uh, a Premier Fury talking about what happened in uh uh in newfoundland when they shut down the cod fishery what a uh what a pivot that was and and how fundamentally it it basically wrecked the demographics thanks for listening Corey. uh but it's true and like if if you were to you know what is the equivalent uh alberta's equivalent of what the cod fishery was to newfoundland is what the energy industry is and like we can't just fucking bullshit ourselves about what's being contemplated here uh, for the province of Alberta, and and people aren't stupid. Like you can you can call it spin all you want. You're talking about fundamentally shutting down the primary generator of wealth and employment in the province of Alberta. And and if you think anybody is going to be so obtuse and unself interested to go along with that plan voluntarily, uh, you know you're you're deluding yourself. That's not spin. That's just I think it's it's the equivalent of gravity. You know, okay. it's, uh, I'm not gonna like, take it's, it's just so fundamental. I'm not going to take Corey's bait on an energy policy debate because then we would lose our last three listeners. But Oh, Jordan, you've just disappointed Max Fawcett so much. He would so I desperately know. want you to rise to this fight. Insufficiently yes. revolutionary. But here's what I am going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it is true that people are not stupid, Corey. But that includes workers and energy companies in Alberta. The the future is coming and the future is low carbon. And that is not a choice that Rachel Notley made. That is not a choice that Justin Trudeau made. That is a global reality that is happening. The transition is happening. And if you look at what oil companies are doing in Canada and frankly have been doing for decades, is that they are making their business plans contingent on these future carbon prices, greater investments in renewables, and so on and so forth. Workers also understand that changes are coming and they are going to be looking for support through this. And I think that there is absolutely a way for whoever is in charge in Alberta, including the NDP, to articulate a path forward that doesn't leave people behind. And that's really the important thing. People are feeling (laughs) concerned about the future. They're feeling worried about what their path is going to be through this. And they are looking for somebody that they can trust uh, to have their back. And the question is, does Danielle Smith have their back? Can she change the laws of gravity, if you will, on this? She really probably can't. So I'm not sure that it's quite as cut and dried as you'd like to present it as. And I would submit to you that the people who are working in this field uh, every day are quite familiar well, with some of the outside we're talking, forces. We're talking, I, would, we're I just want to say something. I don't, the I don't see it going down that way. I don't see it going down that way. Because... Nobody's ever, ever, ever going to be grateful for this just transition fund or, or, or sustainable worker fund, whatever it is, because people will fight to save their jobs for as long as they can. They're not going to abandon the hope of their job in favor of the just transition fund. They'll fight to hold their job as long as they can. And then if they lose their job, they're going to be angry about that. They'll take yeah. the money or the talking, training or whatever clear, the fuck it is. I'm not talking is. about the fund. The fund is not, a, that is, that is. That is packaging like, that came we're, from we're, Ottawa. We're, that is not useful. But what is useful? You're, you're talking about you're talking is, global energy pol- policy. I, I'm I'm talking politics. Like you you will never get elected on a on a plan that is basically some enhanced version of of employment insurance and and the mass shutdown of of a sector of the economy over time. Uh, that of, of which that jurisdiction is overwhelmingly reliant upon. Like. I, I, who is going to vote for that? Yeah, I want to be uh, really clear. What I'm talking about who is going to vote for that? Is getting elected on the basis of of who it is that the people of Alberta feel are going to be on their uh, side yeah, yeah. through they, the rough they, waters. They don't. They don't. They're, nobody coming. is. Nobody is. Nobody is going to enthusiastically jump up and down and say, "Hey, you know." Uh, you know, I want I want to have this undertaker for my funeral. You know, they're going to it's going to be a really beautiful coffin. And, you know, and we're going to be you know, I'm going to be buried under this beautiful tree. Nobody wants that. They want to keep living like they want a doctor. They don't want a mortician. 
And okay. uh, you know, and I think that's that's ultimately <clears throat> but, the difference in, between what's being Scott's sold. got a last Scott's got a last word just, on Alberta. Well, I just uh, I Unless agree I with that. I disagree with it, which I'll have the last word. Exactly. Uh, I I agree with all that, but embedded in 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 what Jordan is saying, I think is another factor which we recognized and surpassed at the top of the discussion of this, right? Um for all the strategic struggles that, uh, how Notley needs to position herself in terms of the future the energy economy, so on and so forth, and the healthcare conversation. There is still the inevitable truth, right? The raccoons have not left a forwarding address. They are still firmly occupying Premier Smith's head. And and I just think she remains an X factor in this because I think her team is very strong. And the evidence is what we've seen in recent weeks, that they have become more disciplined, that they have improved their position, that they've reoriented the ship and but, you know, even last week, she's out with a video about talking about how, you know, eons ago, indigenous people and settlers came together to fight for future prosperity. It's like, what is this, a John Ford fucking movie? Like, she's not, she is capable of saying ridiculously. Yeah, but that's not, as offen- that's not as offensive to the average person as you might hope that it was. I'm using uh, it as, a lustr- as an illustration of ill discipline, not necessarily that specific thing, although I think that specific well, thing is. Look, stupid. Look, if, if, if but uh, thing- she can blow herself up. And there's a, just let me say this there's a first minister's meeting, or I should say, rather, there's a, a premier's meeting on health. Uh, today as we tape this and you know will she have the discipline to go through uh, this set of meetings and maintain the message that she had last week or will she sort of veer off of the microphone because she sort of you know uh decides that's uh you know that's uh, she's bored of that song and she'd like to uh she'd like to drop some new bars uh, you just can't know with her i, just Corey, wanted to say, though, I think what, the progressive quick points from both of you then. yeah like it is wishful thinking to think she's just going to defeat herself there has to be, there has got to be an active hand in that. So I think but I she think could. The, <laughs> the raccoons can take over. Yes, it's true. Yeah. But but I we're think, not talking about John Tory anymore, are we? <laughs> no, right? No, we are not. Okay, Maurice, <laughs> what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> active hands. I'm sorry. Stop! Stop! <laughs> <laughs> Grief. <laughs> Can't do this on TV either. <laughs> Work blue. Go totally I into the, the smut mo- dungeon. I think the most important thing Jordan said, she said early, which is that the NDP need to gear up their war room. They may find an issue that works for them. It could be education. It could be something else. But fundamentally, most of the issues work against them and they're going to win this election because not because uh, Smith is crazy and they've got to pull out the big crazy stick and start beating her around the head with it until she's back to where she was in the public mind six months ago, as opposed to where she is right now. That's my view. Yeah. Well, look, they, they have to, what I was going to close on is if the conversation stays as it has been on this podcast today, uh, not Lee is going to get her ass fucking kicked. Uh, <laughs> Because the, 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 this is not a conversation in which there are any, a sufficient number of votes for her in Calgary or anywhere else in Alberta to win. They, she needs to have a, 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 this be a referendum on Daniel's judgment or you know, on some other element of this that is not this. Because if it is a, 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 a ballot, if the ballot question is, do you agree with the just transition plan to shut down the en- energy industry and who's going to do it, you know, with more flowers at the funeral, then the NDP is going to get their fucking ass kicked. They're going to get it kicked from, from Lethbridge to, 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 uh, to Edmonton and back. Like it's, it's, it's going to be ugly. They've got to get onto a different narrative if they want to have any chance of, of, of going anywhere. If it's this narrative, Daniel wins and, it, and it's not going to be close. You pulled out Lethbridge on purpose. That's mean. <laughs> NDP need to win Lethbridge. So what would you say about a public policy that could result in up to 115,000 Canadian workers getting a chance to own the companies they work for, to share in the wealth building that right now goes to their owners, and that all this can be done without those employees having to pay for their ownership because the payment would come from the company's future profits? Sounds too good to be real? Well, this is a policy that already exists in the U.S. and U.K. hurly burlyites. In the U.S., 14 million American workers currently share $1.7 trillion in wealth 
through a policy called employee ownership trusts. In the UK, a record 300 businesses were sold to employees in 2021 alone. Some frontline workers have retired as millionaires because of it. Here in Canada, a majority of business owners are planning on selling their businesses over the next 10 years. Many of them would prefer to sell to the employees who made their businesses successful. But unlike the UK and the US, Canadian law and tax policies don't provide a simple way to do it. The Canadian government has committed to bringing employee ownership trust to this country, hopefully in this upcoming budget. If it happens, those 115,000 Canadian workers could accumulate collective personal wealth of almost $10 billion over eight years. It's a big opportunity, one that requires creating incentives through the tax system for owners to get a fair return in selling to employees and for all employees of a company to be able to participate in ownership. Those have been the keys to success in the US and UK. Without those incentives that government would get back in taxes over time, this policy will not work. The Canadian Employee Ownership Coalition, a network of business, nonprofit, and charity sector leaders, wants to unlock the massive potential of employee ownership here in Canada. Budget 2023 is the time to do it. To learn more, go to employee-ownership.ca. Okay, last topic today. Mr. Polyev. It's been down in the southwestern part of Ontario. Drew a crowd of a couple of thousand people in Windsor. Looked pretty good on uh, video. I saw it on Twitter. Looked like a good crowd. It's a working class town. It's a labor town. Conservatives are hyping it. Corey, does it mean anything? I think it means a lot, actually. Um, you know, the Windsor area is, is one of the these areas where uh, in the provincial election in Ontario, we saw a, a big shift in terms of, of popular support for the Conservative government. It's been a question, I think, uh, since then as to whether or not Polyev can convert uh, folks in a similar way to what Ford did. Uh, you know, basically traditional NDP supporters who are part of organized labor working at auto plants or in, you know, in construction trades, etc., uh, and there's there's signs of that. He this past week was down there meeting with many of those unions, many of those union members, uh, and he blew the doors off a rally. Uh, and I think it was about a week earlier. Trudeau was down there. Uh, you know, his event was small. You know, they had the the SWAT team out and the drones in the sky and protesters outside, et cetera, et cetera. Is you know, it, it reminded me of a a, a 2015 Harper event. Uh, you know, sparse in numbers and uh, high on security. And, and Polyev, uh, you know, had lines up out the door and other rooms with TVs in them so that people could watch. Like, th that's what Trudeau was doing in 2015. And, uh, uh, and I think it's, it's demonstrative of, of support. Uh, and uh, I think it's in a. When in Trudeau was doing that, Corey, 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 when Trudeau was doing that in 2015, the Liberals also had a significant lead on the Conservatives in Ontario. Like, we're mm -hmm. not seeing a groundswell in the polling about Ontario. The Conservatives by, generally seem to be in a rough tie with the Liberals now in Ontario, which is better than it's been. But it's not indicative that Ontario is swinging Conservative well, the way it looked in 2015. Well, you got to remember that, that Ontario, uh, you know, province-wide numbers in Ontario don't tell you a lot. You really have to look at the regional numbers uh, because Toronto is such a dead zone for conservative support. Uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, tied numbers in Ontario should be electing more conservatives uh, than liberals, if uh, all things being equal. So, yeah. it, like, it really depends on what those regional numbers look like, and you know, it, it, what what are they in the nine hundred five belt? Uh, what are they in, in the Niagara, uh, Hamilton area? What are they in the Southwest? What are they in the North? And, you know, uh, and then what are they in Eastern Ontario? Uh, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's a big enough population that there are sort of several provinces within, within the boundaries of Ontario. Yeah, so, sure. the, you know, the macro horse race numbers don't say a lot, but, you know, what do we do know from them? Look, uh, the Conservatives have been ticking up slowly. Uh, they're in a better position. I think similar to, what we've talked about in other areas, uh, uh, the fact that the healthcare deal is done and and is, I think, going to be receding from the headlines from where it was earlier, 
uh, is good news for them because if things tacked back more towards economic issues, which they seem to be, if they tack towards crime issues, which they seem to be, these are these are bo- both vote drivers for the conservatives, and I think put them in a good strategic position. Uh, so I think there's lots to worry about. I think there's lots of, for the NDP to worry about. I think they're getting squeezed from both sides right now. Uh, and, um, you know, there's reasons, I think, for, for the Polyev team to feel optimistic uh, about their prospects today in Ontario. And, and uh, you know, the challenge will be similar to what we talked about for, for Alberta. The Liberals have got to, you know, keep the focus on health care and on values issues and other stuff. But, you know, if it's, if it's crime in the economy, it's a, t- it's a tough slog for the Liberals. You know, Scott... They're obviously trying to run, the federal conservatives are obviously trying to run the same plan that the Ford conservatives ran at labor and at working class men particularly. But it's a different guy and a different message. I mean, Ford versus Polyev, Ford looks that part so much more than Polyev does. Ford looks like he might actually have been on a shop room floor at some point in his life. Polyev doesn't. And the second thing is it's a different message. Ford had a very centrist, moder- uh, we're going to build shit. We're going to work with business. We're going to work with people. We're going to do things. And Polyev's more like, well, we're going to get out of the way and other people will do things. So it's a different guy with a different message. On the other hand, he's running against Singh and, po- and Trudeau, two guys that don't have much connection to that group of people. So what do you think? Uh, instead of analysis, I'll offer you an anecdote. Like a lot of people, I went to a bar yesterday, to watch a football game. And I bet just like you guys, sometimes I'll be in a bar and before the kickoff yesterday, as an example, somebody said, hey, this loser knows something about politics or hangs around with politicians or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so like five people turn and start like engaging on every political issue under the sun. Very quickly, Polyev was brought up. Very quickly, this phenomenon occurred, right? The six people talking to me were four men and two women. The four men were like, fuck Trudeau and fuck all his fuck. And you know what? I'm for Polyev and that guy like right on. And they started like doing and they sounded very much like the lunch bucket crowd that he's appealing to who are who are feel uh, uh, displaced, threatened, don't like what's going down, uh, have a string of complaints. They can virtually repeat Polyev's messaging. Um without uh, making reference to it because that messaging is, that he's composed is actually the message they sit around the bar and talk about. Uh, and the two women were like, that fucking guy uh, makes me, I, I don't know, that guy's bad. That guy scares the living bejesus out of me. And, and these are their girlfriends, right? So you see that divide. Where that anecdote takes me is this. Um, he does not close the deal as completely and as easily and without tension in the way that Ford has been able to or other types of politicians we've seen over the years. So to the degree to which there is an effort to build around him a little bit of a a personality momentum and all that, uh, there's there's a lot of work to do. And we know the gender divide, just to use that one uh, factorial, is is a big deal. All of where it takes me to this conclusion, um, and we've said it a million times, I do think the NDP are in desperate straits. I think the mano a mano fight uh, particularly in Ontario, is going to really leave the NDP uh, in the cold. I just, you know, it, it it looks difficult. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's one observation. But at least me, I, just repeating what you've said so many times, David, which is that if you want to run and get reelected for the fourth consecutive election, minority or majority, something that hasn't happened since Sir John A., there's only one way you're going to get it done, and that is to take a fucking bat to your opponent. And I just don't understand why when he's drumming up these crowds, there are not ads everywhere that are inescapable telling people who Polyev is, diminishing his ability to reach out, underscoring the anxiety that those two women out of the six people talking to me have, and just pounding away on it. Old quotes, hit his greatest, you know, they pound must on be his short, greatest They must hits. be short of cash. They, they would be I, doing it if they weren't short of cash. They've got and, to be short of cash. And if they think, well, I don't want to waste it now because I can do it later. No, right? People still don't know this guy's introducing himself. And you don't want him to be the guy that I hear can draw 3,000 people on a shop floor. You want him to be the guy who said this horrible fucking thing that I disagree with. And I just think they got to start taking out the grapefruit spoon and carving his innards. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much they believe in advertising, um, the Trudeau people, because, you know, they didn't like the advertising getting so much profile in the 2015 campaign because they felt it took away from the intrinsic merit of the campaign and that they'd won despite or beside advertising. So maybe they don't think it's as useful as I do, but I sure think if they had the money, they should be out there right now. 
Um, Jordan, Scott started to talk about something which I wonder about, which is, is it possible for the NDP to appeal to working class men with purely a populist economic message? Or is a lot of the support for the conservatives among this group of peop people rooted culturally now? And you're going to have to find a way to make them more comfortable with either the federal NDP or Jagmeet in order to get their votes. <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, I think the short answer to your question is, is no. <laughs> I think it's really hard. I think that right now we no, are... No, you can't do it just with economics is what you're saying. Yeah, or that that's not yeah. going to loosen those voters. Yeah. I think that at this point, the 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 axis, the divide, you know, as we've discussed many times in the podcast, is a cultural one, right? This has be, this has become very deeply entrenched. It is heavily gendered. Um, these white men of, you know, of that age group, like a lot of them are are going to be quite motivated and quite sticky to Polyev as voters. And I think that loosening them, um, that that's a really challenging proposition, but the women, working class women, uh, this is absolutely a different question. Yes, those are is. the vote. Those are the voters that New Democrats can and should be working to reach urgently. Those are voters that are very gettable. That's uh, Trudeau's last base. Yes, but those are voters that are very very gettable for New Democrats. And I think you know, particularly like if we look at somewhere like Windsor, you know, like. Does this rally, does this energy surprise me? No, not really. I mean, Windsor has long been uh, a blue-orange fight. Um, you know, the No, 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 no. It's not a blue-orange fight. It's never been a blue-orange fight. It's been a it's been a red-orange fight. Come on. Like, yeah, David, back me up on this. Like we haven't had a seat there in 50 years provincially. It is a orange and red flat fight. When I when I was involved provincially, it was uh, only an orange fight. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but, but you had Dwight Duncan. We and, we, we, uh, we walked yeah, we yeah. walked away from the fight in 2018. That's right. I yeah, mean, we will Corey. We will give you your kudos that like you know Lisa Gretzky is the is the last one standing provincially, right? There's a little island, but you know I I think I think that it's it's not to me surprising that in in an area that comprises not just unionized workers, but also really large swaths of rural, uh, you know, and, and agricultural uh, spaces around like the Essex area, like to draw a crowd like that, that, you know, I'm not really. Jordan, serious. Jordan, 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 Jordan. When the fuck did Jagmeet draw 2000 people anywhere under any circumstances? 2000 is a big crowd. Yeah, no, it's I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not saying it's not a big crowd. I'm also just not saying I'm not surprised, but right. I want to come back to something that Scott brought up, which is which is the story that these, these rallies are telling and how that can be characterized by Polyev's opponents and the opportunities that are being missed here. So we've talked a lot on the podcast about Polyev's challenge with likability, and this goes to the gender question as well. And I think that there is there's a way to frame this as a, being a very narrow outreach to the same people on the same angry issues with the same negativity that a lot of women find very off-putting. Um, and that's something, that's a story that could be told uh, to counter the story about this being some sort of a growth in, in Polyev's connection with labor. And, you know, and I think we should have a separate conversation about that because there's a really cautionary tale, obviously, in Ontario about how that can go. You can put all the energy you want into courting labor votes uh, and then overreach and blow it up, right? So I think that, it is, to me, astounding still that the Liberals have not come on strong with any kind of definition around what it is that Polyev is doing out there and who he's talking to and the message he's bringing, because it is not a positive message. There's a lot of room there to characterize it, and it's crickets from the Now liberals. he's a moderate on health care. Right. Now yeah, he's a I moderate mean, on health care. Like, was fuck, more critical me. of the health care deal than Pierre Polyev was. There isn't, a, there isn't a piece of paper that you can slide between Trudeau and Polyev on health care right now. I don't understand yeah. it. Yeah. In any of it, we got to move on. It's time for Gordon Pinson and the Hey Yous. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The Hey Yous are about to begin. Scott, fire away. Okay. My hey, you goes to David Wake, the Integrity Commissioner in Ontario. Sorry, Corey, maybe we should cover your ears. Hey, David Wake, you suck at your job. 
You suck at your job. I don't give a goddamn what the code of conduct says. If a, the premier of the of the province of Ontario can have people on his behalf and solicit every developer in the goddamn province, send out flyers, say, come to the stag and all kinds of fucking dough party for a thousand dollars a ticket. My cousin got married for five bucks and a shot of rye. I mean, a thousand dollars a ticket. And the finding is, you know what? Some of these developers are just his friends. Okay, that's possible. I, I, I can understand. That's not beyond the realm of possibility. But do not tell me that when those people were being solicited, as there are independent objective reports saying, that this doesn't constitute a violation of the Integrity Act. It just stinks to high heaven. Come on, do your job, man. If they're such close friends, doesn't that raise other conflict issues? Anyway, I shouldn't intervene in somebody else's hey you. Uh, Jordan, what do you got? My hey you is going out to all my fine progressive friends in Toronto. Do not be distracted. Do not let there be a center-left vote split. Get your shit in order. We've got some great folks. There's, you know, we got Mike Layton. We got newcomers like Alejandro Bravo, Butila Carpaccio, and the MPP. Like, there's, there's lots of people out there. Pick one. <laughs> and unite behind them because this is going to be a big, wide race. And if you're able to hold it together, uh, there could be a good prize at the end. Ah, all right. Mayor of Toronto. Corey, hey, you. Well, I'm going to send mine to John Tory. I, I, I'm going <laughs> to give him a little bit of a personal advice or having watched people go through resignations and everything. Get on a plane, find, find some place far away where nobody knows anyone in the city of Toronto and uh, uh, throw your Florida, throw maybe? your phone throw your phone in the pool uh, so you can't look at uh, social media or any of those things and just go to ground for a little bit and uh, and and let this uh, let this blow over and then uh, come back and and uh, get back to get back to life. But the, there's always an intensity around these sorts of situations, and they're never helped by by uh, you know uh, being uh, be, being in Toronto and trying to live your life as normal. It's not, not, a, not a good place to be. Well, unfortunately, he can't go to his exclusive place in Florida because I think word has drifted down there as well. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, so my hey you goes out to Dennis Dawson. My friend of 40 years, Dennis Dawson, last week retired from the Senate. It was a great party for him at the Metropolitan Brasserie in Ottawa. Very, very well attended. I know Dennis was touched that the Prime Minister came and showed up, tried to do some rapprochement after throwing him out of the Liberal Party uh, seven years ago or whenever that was. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Dennis... and cabinet ministers, movie stars and actresses. <laughs> Dennis is a great, great guy who has fought hard for Quebec in Ottawa and fought hard for Canada in Quebec. And uh, he and his uh, wife, Anne, have made a great contribution to Canadian politics and Canadian public life, and I salute them. And uh, Dennis, it was a great send-off, and take care of yourself in retirement. We'll talk, no doubt. That's our show for this week. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS. I want to thank CN Rail, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, and the Canadian Employee Ownership Coalition. Thank you all for your sponsorship. Thank you, everybody who watched or listened. And thank you, Jordan, Scott, and Corey. This was a great show, great talk. Thanks. Well, we won't use the word good talk. It was a great talk. Take care of yourselves. Bye.